Yeah, I just want to say, first of all, before uh, I even ask any questions, I want to say I just really love the documentary. Uh, it was really high quality because I know, like, I know there's always like videos that come up every now and again about like Boogie 298, like what's going on with him, you know? Yeah. Uh, a lot of sort of like commentary videos. And yours is really different from the ones I'd seen before, where it's sort of uh, more of like typical like commentary YouTuber channels sort of talking about him. Uh, where you actually kind of, you know, you put in the work, you went there, uh, actually like spent time with him and like, you know, got to uh, really dug deep and also went really into the nitty gritty with the, the finances and stuff. So yeah, really well done. I even mentioned like, I thought it was like, you know, something I wouldn't be surprised if I saw in like a streaming service like Netflix or something. It really just differentiates from all the other sort of like documentaries you see on YouTube. Well, I appreciate that and uh, appreciate you checking it out. Yeah, thank you. So my first question is, first of all, how did you actually get started as like a documentary filmmaker? Uh, because I saw on your IMDb, I uh, mentioned that you are the founder of Clum Creative and you have your own company. So I want to know a bit about how you got started, uh, why this turned into making YouTube documentaries. It, are the people here, or is it mostly film class, or what? what's the nature of this? Uh, yes, this is a film. This... A lot of people sat, like, in the back and stuff. Oh, okay, all good, all good. So I was a film student uh, for a very short period of time. I ended up dropping out, um, and I, I really would, I started doing music videos. I grew up, I grew up, I live in a city called Cleveland, Ohio uh here in the u.s and there's different rappers and things and i would basically go on twitter this is probably back in 2011 2012 and i would just meet different rappers on twitter and i would make them a music video uh and they would pay me a hundred dollars and then 150 dollars and then 200 dollars. so this is that was my really my very first thing I did was making music videos before then I had done some things with my friends. Um, uh, just, you know, comedy sketches in high school, just to kind of mess around on Facebook and things and, and get people talking at the school. Uh, but I, when I was at school, when I was in college, I met a guy who told me he had a video production company and I just thought that sounded like a really cool thing. Now, looking back he was just some kid with a camera but he he like had a website and everything i just thought that was sounded so cool so i um i ended up leaving college and started i just basically said i have a video production company now i, I was not very good at making videos my first music video was really bad and i didn't end up even getting paid for it just because it was so bad and everyone knew it and then um yeah, from there, I, I just kind of kept making videos uh, for eventually I got a business client who paid me like $600 to make a video for their carpet business. And then um, I uh, slowly got a little bit better because I would just basically make these commercials and make these videos. And these were kind of like mini documentaries for these little businesses, right? Where you're like carpet business, you make a two minute little documentary about their their business and then um yeah basically 10 years later uh, i had eventually had grown a whole business so i got really into the sales component where i was selling video services to businesses um doing their marketing videos i started to learn how to sell animation so i really took more of the entrepreneurial business route after i was able to kind of build a freelance career in offering corporate video services um and i had always maintained a certain interest in entertainment but um you know i i basically pursued kind of what was working for me which was this money making sort of venture which was making commercials um and then i had started some other youtube channels some of them worked some of them didn't but i was never really the face and then I just got to a stage in my career that, um, you know, I, I have done a few different businesses uh, that are, are successful and mostly around the video space um, and decided that, hey, like, 
I've, 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 I've produced a lot of work sort of behind the scenes. Um, let me try to, uh, let me try to do something that, that is a bit more forward facing in terms of my name or my creativity and just happen to come across the whole opportunity to do something with Boogie 2988 and uh, it happened to do well on YouTube. Yeah, that is really impressive because now it's sitting at 4.2 million views on YouTube, I believe, which is insane, especially like on your YouTube channel. It's like your one and only YouTube video right now. So just yeah, blew up. And it's that yeah, it's definitely a unique situation. I mean, uh, I uh, it's it's you know, I would like to say I I had this envisioned. I mean, I, I kind of did in some way. I thought it I would hope it would do well, but you know, so many things in business or entrepreneurship fail. So you, if you're wise with it, you go into it with a certain rational ex, uh, expectation. But this definitely exceeded uh, what I what I thought it would do. Yeah, how did you actually like get in touch with Boogie and get him to agree to this documentary? Yeah, well, I had, I mean, I had a, I have a business publicly that, um, you know, you could Google and you can look at my website. So when I email people, it, you know, it tends to have a certain level of, you know, somewhat authority that comes with that. Um, just given some of the stuff you can read about the business, it's nothing too crazy, but you know. So when I, um, the, my original concept, I, I was watching YouTube. I was really trying to figure out, you know, I was basically bored. Okay. I have built this business. I built this other business. They're both doing well. And I'm just like, okay, making money is fun, but it's not, you know, at a certain point, unless you like, you know, like buying yachts and traveling and doing things, money <laughs> serves its purpose, right? You know, you, you get to a certain, you know, and I live a fairly simple life and uh, I was just very bored. So I'm like, all right, I want to make content. So that was my first. I'm like, I'm going to make content for myself and for my own, my own creativity, which was a different uh, sort of perspective compared to what I was doing for a while, which was just trying to arbitrage money in the world through video and through these other sort of creative mediums. Um, so once I decided, all right, I'm going to make content, then I'm like, all right, well, what content am I going to make? So I thought, well, maybe make, let me make a, a video about, you know, how I built a successful business, right? So I recorded this whole video of just me, like, giving tips about, and I, I watch it back. I'm like, this is so stupid. I don't care about this topic. There's all, I, I don't, I want to sell a course about how to build a business. It, it's just stupid. So I didn't, I didn't put that out. And then I was um, like, all right, well, I don't really feel like starting a podcast. I don't really want to do, like, the whole, uh, you know. You know, I thought about doing like a commentary channel where it's just me talking and, you know, whatever. I'm like, eh, well, there's so many people doing that. And then I, I, I decided like, all right, well, what do I have access to? What, can, what am I good at that, you know, is, is unique, that is, is better than maybe other people in the market? So I was just scrolling through. I saw this um, kind of this 10 minute this channel called Sunny V2. And he makes these like, uh, you know, just like little 10 minute YouTube documentaries where he's just sort of... Um, has a voiceover, has some screenshots, but he puts it out on really timely topics that maybe haven't been commented commented on, and he tends, you know, to do well. So um, I saw this in my stream. I clicked it. It had like seven million views about this guy, and I'm like, okay. And th this was Boogie. It was like Boogie Two Ninety deserves his downfall. I'm like, all right, that's interesting. Should I make stuff like this? I'm like, all right, well, if I just make stuff like this. I'm sure I could do okay, you know, I could grow a little channel or something, but what am I going to do better that's better than Sunny, right? So I'm like, how could I insert myself into this type of content? Um, I'm like, well, wait a second. What if I, instead of just making the video about Boogie, what if I hit up Boogie and convinced him to make a documentary? Um, th that would be like the follow-up to this little 10-minute thing. So I just... I found his email, I wrote him an email and my whole, my whole business, all of my success, mostly in my life has been through the process of outreaching, cold outreach, kind of like how you did to me, finding someone's email, putting together a reasonable, concise message in an email that, that sums up what I can do for them, why this is beneficial to them and hope you hope for the best, right? Yeah. So I, I made a big list of probably 50 to 100 different 
like subjects. Because I'm like, well, what does Sonny V2 do, do, he doesn't have that I could? He doesn't have exclusive access, right? He's just making these videos about people. So if I could gain exclusive access, also he doesn't have all this uh, camera equipment and cinematic sort of uh, producing capability that maybe I have. So if I could take those, if I could get access um, and then I could uh, use my resources and uh, cinematic sort of commercial filmmaking uh, abilities, that would set me apart in this sort of YouTube sphere. So I hit up a bunch of people. Boogie was one of the early people to get back to me. We did a few phone calls and I was able to kind of position the, this to him as something that could could do do benefit for us both. And he happened to agree. And um, we got started probably three, four weeks after our first phone call. Hey, great. So did you approach like any other YouTubers? Do you have any future documentaries like uh, planned out? Is there anything in the works right now? Uh, yeah, I had approached a bunch. I mean, early it was kind of con it was tough for them to justify like putting it on some random guy's channel that doesn't even exist. You know, um, I didn't even have a channel when I was outreaching, so it was I had to kind of be creative in how I was painting the story of of what this could be. And Boogie was the one that just kind of happened to get finished in the most rapid way. There's a there's one that will come out, and then now there's a Boogie got successful then you kind of start to learn all right well if that worked how could we what are the other things and components that made that successful that we can go out and find and so there there's a handful of other uh opportunities a few of which are are moving forward um and then you meet a ton of people too so a lot of it is about getting access so that one gave you a lot of uh you know i guess a bump in potential uh, legitimacy that allows you to when you reach out to people people um you know kind of like okay I, I see that you could deliver something like this so right and earlier you mentioned how like you made like you know videos documentaries for, like other businesses and stuff and now with this like boogie documentary you are like featured quite prominently in it there's a section where we see you talking about what it's like living not living but like you know spending time with boogie and just like the vibe of that and then mm -hmm. you talking with Boogie directly in it. So I was wondering, uh, why did you feel uh, that you wanted to like include yourself uh, prominently in this documentary? And is that going to be a thing that's going to be happening in your future documentaries as well, where you're going to be featuring quite prominently in it? Like, say, someone like Michael Moore, for example, where he's quite like we see him prominently in his own documentaries and such. Uh, yeah, I mean, I thought when I showed up, I had it really prepare. I didn't prepare at all for Boogie, um, because I didn't think it was going to get that many views. So I just started. I just showed up. I'm like, let's just start filming. We don't know what this is going to be. You know, I had just come off the back of investing in a bunch of different YouTube channels, um, that I did e-commerce for, and I had one big success, one major success, and a bunch of them just didn't really work. So I was. I had a pretty bad attitude with, you know, things working, right? I was just like, well, let's try this. I just, I didn't really write or prep interview questions. I didn't even know much about Boogie. So I just sort of showed up, started filming. And the first scenes I was like, all right, well, I'm going to be in it because this is my channel and it's like my debut. So I was trying to, I had a second camera op, but I was trying to, and I was trying to have him film us both. and. After like a half day of doing that, I'm kind of like, well, if, I, if I'm going to do this, I need two camera ops because I want two camera angles. And if I'm on if, and I can't, I'm not going to vlog it because I want it to be like a legit documentary. So I'm like, ah, you know, there's no way to get me in it if I only have one camera op and I want to get two camera angles unless I'm putting something on a tripod, which that's not going to look good. So I'm just like, listen, let's just make this really good. I'll find a way to get in this, you know, because I did want to get some facial recognition because part of the, my motivation for this is, you know, it's partly art, but it's partly just self-expression and getting myself out there and just having fun. Right. So putting myself in, it was just a, a fun way to get myself out there, um, you know, and um, I, I do think a lot, some of the documentaries 
Michael Moore obviously is hilarious and, you know, a legend. Uh, Louis Thoreau. But there's a, there's, they, they, they sort of built that. And I, I, I have seen a lot of uh, just sort of these vice type documentaries where like this random person's inserting themselves. They're adding nothing to it. It's always cutting to them asking some question and sort of, you know, it, you can kind of just sense a certain pretentiousness of like they want to just be in these things. So I just wanted to make my first one really good, regardless of whether or not I was in it. Um, but there was a point at which the documentary was sort of dragging on. I'm like, okay, well, it could make sense to cut to me here. You know, it gives me a little rec facial recognition. And also it could kind of sense people's feedback to me and my personality. And it seemed pretty positive. So I could see other ones, um, you know, that happening. But other ones, it just it's not it would make it not as good it would it, it, you know there's sort of a better to keep a certain mystique on the director or whatever so but yeah that's sort of how when i went i was i was i was like okay this is going to be me and i'm walking around with him and we're it's like kind of like anderson cooper type thing but to me it was a little corny and uh, i didn't bring the right crew to do it so i just immediately went to a different flow so Right. And I'm just wondering, like, how many shooting days was it on this documentary? We shot for a week uh, in the first flow. You know, it just showed up and just started filming. I had prepped a few different things, almost none of which ended up coming out in the documentary. At first, it was going to be much more kind of comedic or just like we were going to try to get him a personal trainer and get him some other things, but uh, ended up not really going that route. Then we came back to once he started dating that girl, we came back and filmed all that. And then um a few more days as you know, it just kind of probably ended up being 10 to 15 days of total filming over a period of six to nine months. Because I actually I did look on uh Boogie's channel. I did see in one of his videos he included some footage from the documentary, and I think some of it didn't uh make it into the uh the final like version that was on your channel. Like I noticed the scene where he was talking to somebody about getting a girlfriend. And I was wondering like about some of that, like cut, uh, deleted scenes from the documentary and how much did you film uh, that? you? Yeah, made? there was a lot of, there was a lot that didn't end up. I'd say we had probably 40 hours of foot. We probably had three, you know, five days of stuff that we tried to get that just didn't fit the story arc. So I just, you know, it would have stretched it. I mean, if I wanted to make this two hours, it's different. I probably could have put all of it in, but I just wanted to make it a, the maximum entertainment hour that I could. Of course, yeah. And I think it's like very well paced as it is. But I'm just like wondering, how did that, uh, like, what was that all about? Like the, uh, the whole thing about trying to get him a girlfriend, if you could explain. Well, the first week, we when we first went, he didn't, I, I thought it would be kind of this ironic sort of fun, stupid scene, right? Because we kind of get him a job, which ended up being a consistent theme because he probably needs to get a job. So we, when we went and did that, that was that ended up staying in. But in a similar vein, we try, you know, got him a stylist and went to Dillard's and tried to get him clothes and, you know, makeover. And while those things had some entertainment value, they, they started to merge too much into mockumentary sort of like joke stuff I, I liked a little bit of that in there just to kind of break up this kind of very depressing sort of uh heavy stuff but i didn't want this to be a like a, a comedy i mean it the whole thing is kind of a comedy right in some way but i didn't want it to be too matter of fact that where, hey, we're trying to play into this joke of Boogie trying to get a girlfriend and trying to get a makeover, which he did all these things. It just didn't really fit. So, yeah. And that's what you have to do sometimes. I mean, you have to just go film a bunch of stuff, try and see what works and be prepared, I think, a lot of times. Um, you know, you film something and in your head you have, you know, this bias was, well, because I filmed it, I have to use it. 
you know, and I think the, the some of the best decisions I've ever made in terms of making videos or whatever is being willing to have wasted my own time, right? Where I'm like, okay, well, we spent two days filming this. It's like, yeah, don't don't put it in, right? Like, don't mm -hmm. just use something just because you 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 know spent a bunch of time and money and and going and getting it. If it's not good and it, it doesn't play into it, just cut it. And sometimes those decisions are are tough, but uh, it can really save a project because there's all these biases. It's like, oh, well, because I came up with the idea, then it's good. Or because I already filmed it, then it's, you know, I have to use it. There's all these stupid biases that you end up putting something out and then someone's like, oh, okay, like, you know, it's not that good. Yeah, I get that totally. Uh, but yeah, there's actually like one of my favorite scenes from the documentary was actually uh, that scene where Boogie does, uh, you mentioned it, where he does go try to get a job. And then there's a little uh, interview that he has. And I'm sh I don't know how many people of here have actually seen the documentary. We have a few, but yeah, for everyone. Oh, else right. Like the, the person in the cast. They, <laughs> we got the, we got yeah. the, I, I see five people. So, you know, oh, the, oh, the K, okay, their cast, they've been healed. It's a, mir it's a miracle. <laughs> so but yeah just for every so yeah i just want to say i think that's uh a really interesting scene on just so many levels first of all what was it like actually like filming that you know in terms well, of just it was it's funny i mean you try not to laugh like you yeah know, it's just, you know it, i mean some of this stuff you know i'm not here to make uh this is not a climate change documentary okay this is a stupid meaningless film okay it's no purpose in this world other than entertainment so you're going into these things uh just trying to make fun fun for the world sometimes at the expense of this individual but he's kind of also in on it yeah. in some way this is a prank on the woman right because mm -hmm. like you're going in they are genuinely trying to pro they're trying to make their company look good they they see this as like a PR opportunity of how good their services are going to be. And they're going to like try to help this guy. I know that this guy has no intention of getting a job, right? He's not, he's mm. coming in as a, he's a, he's a, it's a kamikaze, right? He's coming in to fuck with this person, right? And mm. so can I say the F word? Is this a Christian college or something? <laughs> um, so uh, you can, yeah. Okay, I don't know if Kings is like something. So, um, but he's coming in to mess with this person. And uh, and um, I know this. They, I tried to set her expectations like, hey, I, I think I ended up telling her who he was a little bit. Um, and, but she, uh, it was just, it was just very funny because she's trying to actually provide her service. And I, I kind of know that he's not engaging in good faith, which makes it sort of this, uh, it's, it's this, it's like a prank that's filmed, but also tell something about Boogie is that in some way he believes all these things, but he also doesn't want to get a job despite his situation so it kind of has a multifaceted uh, truth to it, but it it was certainly funny. We all led, ended up leaving and like laughing, right? I mean, it's like that was that was funny. Um, I didn't know. I honestly didn't know. I did not expect that at all to because that was the that was the scene that really kind of people latched onto. Yeah. I mean, on TikTok or Instagram. To me, that was just like this some stupid scene we filmed that was like, you know, I, I was like, this this is not this like, you know, amazing thing. And it's not filmed even that well comparative to the other, the cinematography and some of the other uh, uh, scenes and things. But it just, uh, you know, after you edit it together, it, it, and I saw people make memes like me when I talk to a girl and it's just like him you know, saying all these stupid things about himself. Yeah. So I'm glad people enjoyed it. Yeah, I think it's so interesting, just like the way uh, Boogie as well, kind of like the way he talked about that scene as well on his own channel is where he says, 
he thinks it's hilarious and such. And I don't know, it's interesting because uh, this is the part where, I mean, it's clear to me that, again, he doesn't really, he's not trying to get a job. So he's trolling and it is almost like a troll on this woman. But uh, with the uh, the actual lady, though, she's uh, surprisingly like very, keeps all professional which I thought. Yeah, but I haven't hit her up. Like I didn't, uh, I, I, I just dropped this and then it just all of a sudden went, went so big. And then I haven't, I never reconnect. I'm sure she knows. I'm sure she's been sent this by somebody. I mean, she, I mean, she was in Penguin's video. She was, in, you know, all these big places. So um, they haven't hit me up. I, I just, I didn't want to like, you know, uh, poke the bear. I, I mean, I, I, I don't. I don't even recall if I got like release forms, because uh, I. I honestly thought this would maybe get like a hundred k views. So I'm like, ah, we'll just film this little documentary, put it up. So, you know, I. I it. It just like went way bigger than I expected. But, uh, no, it was. Uh, I'm sure they they've had fun with it, and they ended up looking good through it, right? I mean, she was very. Pro Everyone has positive things to say about her, and she was very professional. So, uh, you know. Yeah. In terms of the, because uh, you mentioned a little bit about cinematography, there is one shot that really just like stands out, uh, even just like, you know, weeks after watching it, which I often think about. And it's this uh, bathtub scene, which uh, I'll show a little bit. There's no like nudity in here, but I just play a little bit of this. You can see this is so just for context to everybody, this is when Boogie. Uh, which has gotten a little controversial where he's uh, 49 years old as of shooting this. And his he has recently got a new girlfriend who is 20 years old. And so you go, you know, you delve a bit into that relationship. And I'm just interested by this shot of them both in the bathtub. Like, what did you like actually like say to both of them uh, to get that shot like in the film? Well, I you got to be convincing in this life, okay? If mm -hmm. you want to do anything, what I did was we were filming other things, and and um, I basically just was like, yeah, let's get in the bath. I, I I just acted as if this was something that we it was just normal to do, right? So when I I I had to, and I was like, okay, we were filming out here. I'm like. All right, next we're going to get in the bathtub and we're just going to do some shots, right? And you just bring it up in a really casual way. So you just kind of introduce it in this very um, sort of like, you know, acceptable way. These are all tactics you want to use in good faith, okay? You know, don't go and do any nefarious uh, manipulation, okay? Only good manipulation. So, because um, to me, they were telling me and if you talk in the beginning of the film, he was talking about how he the best moments of his life has been with women in his bathtub, right? And then he brought rubber yeah. duckies. And so this was a theme. I didn't like come out of this yeah, from like nowhere. Beginning, right. Yeah, yeah. So to me, I'm like, that has to be some type of foreshadowing. And we, if this is something you do, um, as long as it's done tastefully, I think this would like really capture sort of the weirdness of this relationship, right? I mean, we could sit there and talk about this and that, but if we can show you guys in the bathtub together, 49-year-old guy, 20-year-old uh, girl in a bathtub, splashing each other with water, giggling, it's weird, it's, it, it's, it's clickable, it's like it captures the essence of what makes this sort of kind of cringy right um just him in the bathtub alone is cringy let alone now we have this this girl that's been inserted so that's what really it came about i sort of brought it up they're like oh really i'm like yeah no i think this would be interesting it'll be funny i do think also you got to recognize in some sense a guy like boogie he's an entertainer um and he understands entertainment right so it's not like you know, he's also thinking through his head, like, okay, will this be entertaining? And he's willing to enter, go to entertainment even at his own expense. And that was the nature of our working relationship where I would come up with something and, 
you know, as long as it wasn't like ridiculous, he, he would basically be down to engage. And that's fun. That's what, how you're going to create fun, interesting moments. But there's a, there were some people that were like, you know, this ruined the whatever. I'm like, you know, personally to me, yeah, there's, there, you can, there's PBS. You can go watch PBS. There's all types of great. You can watch Ken Burns. You know, he'll make a, you know, you'll go watch some Ken Burns documentaries. There's all types of documentaries you can watch. This is a meaningless documentary uh, just for pure entertainment. So it's entertaining. I put it in. If it's not entertaining, I won't put it in. So uh, that's why I put it in because it's, it's got some shock factor. It's fun. It, it captures uh, a certain aspect of the weirdness. And, um, and he was willing to do it. I mean, ultimately, if you obviously would have said no, I would have been like, yeah, it's fine. But, uh, you know, he was willing to do it. Yeah, I'm just curious then, because uh, I see you made a documentary on this YouTuber. Who is someone that you'd like to make a documentary on? Uh, you know, it's funny because I would like Boogie. I didn't really know much about Boogie, and um, I I wasn't really super into the whole internet lore around him or sort of, sort of these people. But I guess to me, I do enjoy stuff that people I like meeting a consumer demand in a real way. Yeah. So I've found fun in learning about these new things that people happen to have a lot of consumer demand for. And um so yes. Okay. So creep, I had the I I spent there were two full days I watched every creep on YouTube every creep cover possible. Uh, I mean, it literally just what listening and listening and listening and listening and listening and listening. And listening. Um, I found I've sent this to a few people. I'm not like trying to hide it. I'll share my screen again. Let's go back. So there was two versions of creep. One was creep cover Danielle. This one. Danielle Ponder, which some people found. Some of the comments were like, um, you know, anyone hear from the Boogie documentary? I don't know if you can hear this. But um, super random cover. So Daniel Ponder. And then the other one, what I think was Vega Choir Creep. Uh, no, or might have been. Let me see. Yeah, Vega Choir. I think it's it's this one. Um, another variation of that. Um, and then I I basically I downloaded tons of them, and then I brought them in. I sort of adjusted some of the 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 uh, pitch, and the uh, the duration. I sort of dragged it, slowed it down, so it could kind of fit. And then that's kind of you how you found those. Um, one was in the trailer, and then I had the Danielle Ponder one. Um, um, and there were some other ones I almost used that were like super off the grid. I mean, she's only, she's only got like 90,000 views. It's not like nothing, but it definitely wasn't. You, you had to really dig. Um, and then the other music, mostly, mostly um, music bed. Music bed, there's like when you're getting music, I'd say there's like I'd say there's like three main uh tiers. The bare the baseline tier, and this is where you all start at, is audio jungle. I mean you've probably heard the audio jungle, right? It and there's a lot of shitty music on audio jungle. But every now and then you can find some decent music. Usually stuff that's a bit more um hokey, right? Like if you in the scene in the boogie doc when the the friend it shows the friends and it's playing this like eighties fanfare, you know uh, it's it's kind of this like it's like almost comedic. That's the song. That's this song, right? So it's for twenty four bucks. You get it and you're good. Um, then you want to step up. You then go to premium beat. These are a little bit more premium, right? Um, there was a few songs in here. That we used, 
but the majority of the good songs the more premium like the you know, kind of the higher end stuff with vocals like the the song at the end um it was and a lot of these bands are the, they're bands that are on like spotify and they have good music but they're just not like touring and huge or something so you can license this for 50 100 200 bucks or you have a subscription to this so this was the ending song so um yeah so but it that's the number one time suck is the music i mean i probably spend just as much time finding the music as i do editing because because i started with music videos and i was so used to just like editing to music once i can't even edit until i have the music selected right if i find once i find the music for a section then i can edit to it um, and then it basically falls into place pretty quickly after you have the music. But it's just finding the music. Because in my view, you want to be able to, if I just made a playlist on Spotify that was all the music for the, that you could l watch it and you, you could listen to the whole thing and kind of get some sense of what maybe the vibe or the film is, is you know what I mean? So um, that, 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 that's, a, you're basically scouring covers and, um, occasionally just because you don't want to overuse the covers um and then you're scouring these you know kind of royalty free sites um knowing that 99 percent of it's trash and you're going to find that one fit of a of a gem that sort of fits that people actually think is like some original composition just because it fits so well um and i've done i've used original composers and commercials before but it's tough because a lot of times what I will do if I am going to do that, I'll find a song that somebody made that's pretty close. Then I'll contact the guy or the girl that made it and be like, hey, can you take out those drums or maybe you can extend this section. Um, also, there's a lot of like taking a song, like chopping it up a lot, right? Where you're like taking a certain part of it and sliding it over and you're not playing it all the way through. You have to kind of create this like sort of zombie cut of the song. So. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. You mentioned in the documentary how depressing the environment of the whole sort of household was. I was wondering, you know, what was what that was like for you psychologically and for the crew, and um, what that experience sort of uh, felt like to be a part of. Yeah. Um, well, as any creative uh, liberal art individual and i would encourage you all we all need therapy we're all messed up particularly if we're in a film class we're making films we all have trauma so i'm very therapized so i was uh very uh prepared to have my own boundaries of engagement i think most of them for me came up around his financial situation um where he would i, I kind of knew how much money he had and I was getting stressed for him because we're like spending the whole day filming. I'm in the back of my head, like, dude, you should be streaming. I'm not paying you for this. Like, I kind of feel a little bad that I'm like taking up your whole day or taking up your whole week. You're not publishing, like, you know, or or just certain things of financial decisions that I just disagreed with. You know, he has a roommate that wasn't paying him rent. I'm like, what's going on? That could change everything if he just started doing this. Well, okay, well, he had work. So there's a lot of things that I I wanted to sort of make decisions for him or help him that you have to just be, um, kind of set your own boundaries of when and how you're going to engage with somebody's problems. Um, it was a little taxing, you know, because I'm like, yeah, you know. Also, just the whole home. You know, I my I don't have a you know a mansion or something, but I like my you know you see this. There's no trinkets on the walls. I don't have any Pikmin, Pac-Man. This nice, clean, more minimalistic. You know, he, he had so many things. He has more things in one room than I've ever had. So there was just a lot. It was almost like this museum of trinkets that was just a that just um. It's a different vibe that maybe I'm used to. Um, in my home so uh yeah i would say the two things but no you, you i was able to sort of process it in a way like okay well that's your problem 
just because you're bringing it up often doesn't make it my problem and I'm not obligated to fix your problems. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Oh, Spike has another one. Yeah, um, obviously I had a huge launch, like in terms of you, is it? Like, I remember seeing it on my homepage, it kind of just, I just want to know what do you put that down to, that, that big reach, that big launch? Was it just his notoriety or was there anything else you guys did to like market it and get it out there? Well, I had him, he did a lot of videos on his channel that sort of helped build some interest leading up into it. Um, at least within his sort of micro community. Um, I think on the premiere, so the I had dropped the trailer and that had maybe 15,000 views, right? Because he had posted about it on his channel. We did a react to the trailer from his channel. And then maybe like two creators reacted to the, but really small creators had reacted to the trailer, which ultimately had ended up about 1,700 people had joined the premiere live on the 31st. And the first day got like 50,000 views. And my goal, I expected this thing maybe to get like 300,000 views, right? That was kind of like, that would be not a, not a massive success, but that would be like, okay, it makes sense. Brand new first channel, maybe it over time, maybe over time it'll climb to a million and that would be a, a good thing. Um, First day, 50,000. I'm like, all right, good start. And then it sort of tapered off a little bit. Then I started getting all these emails from people that I like really looked up to. Like Meat Canyon emailed me, who does like the the animations. I'm like, whoa, Meat Canyon has followed me on Instagram and said how good this was. CoffeeZilla sent me an email. I'm like, whoa. And then I started, the somebody uh, started reacting to it few different channels and it got up to 300,000 in the first week. I'm like, okay, this thing, this thing could hit a million. And then I get home. Um, and so I, at this point, we're not doing any marketing. It's just sort of sitting out there. Boogie's dropping sort of like little clips that are extended scenes or just mentioning it, which kind of gets it another 5,000 views each time that maybe he does it. And then I get home uh, from this weekend trip and then um my friend calls me and he's like, dude, you see penguins? I'm like, dude, shut up, shut up, shut up, stop. He's like, dude, penguins. Did... I'm like, dude, you're trolling me. Penguins did not do a video about the documentary. And he, I, I looked up, I'm like, holy, I saw the thumbnail. It was Boogie. I'm like, dude, does he talk about us? He's like, dude, he says your name in the first like 30 seconds. I'm like, oh my God. And his video just went crazy. He got like 6 million views, uh, almost 6 million or something. And uh, yeah, that, that day it got a million views. And really for YouTube, the whole algorithm is watch time, right? So I think what made this video meaningful is that there's one, an established market for content about Boogie, right? When you think about YouTube, there's all these sort of content pockets, right? You know, there's, there's a market for content about Boogie or content about Brendan Schraub or content about you know, whoever that is in these certain sort of YouTube oriented pockets. And if it, let's say there's a pocket of 50 million total people in the last year that have watched a video about Boogie, right? Um, any video about him, or, or let's just say it's even 10 million. And there's enough of these big videos that that, that pool is 10 million or 40 million. If you, in my view, if you put out a video that, uh, YouTube's going to serve that video to, if you put out any video about Boogie, they're going to serve it to a small portion of that total audience. And then of those first viewers, it's going to sense, are they clicking through, right? So that comes under title and thumbnail. Like, is the title and thumbnail interesting enough to get them to get click through? And then is the video good enough where they're going to watch long enough, right? So they can watch 10 minutes versus five minutes versus one minute. And the video had an average view duration of like 20 minutes in the first week. So to YouTube, it's like, okay, well, hey, here's this audience of 10 million people that want bogey content. Here's a video that's getting 20 minutes of people staying on our platform. Let's push it. So if you look at the, um, I'll just sort of share my screen. If you look at the, uh, 
sort of um, uh, what are we doing here? Uh, it's got content. Um, this is the penguins date. So this was the early days, and then once penguins hit it, obviously this is it. Just the views went crazy. Um, but you can see reach here as well. Like this is what, like impressions. You can see the difference in click through rate, and then um, really though, this is the the key metric in many ways. Average view duration of the people that are coming to your video. What's the average amount of time they spend watching? So this first week, or this first few days is 20 minutes. So YouTube's like, oh shit, we got a video that's keeping somebody for 20 minutes. We need to get this thing out there, right? And then when other people are reacting, it just, it, you know, it sort of um, con continues to uh, uh, compound that. And it kind of hovered between, you know, it's, it's down to maybe 13 minutes now just because it's, being pushed now more to people that are not really into boogie so that that attention span is going to be a little bit less to those people because you probably tapped into you've gotten 90 million impressions at this stage so you probably tapped out all the people that have ever watched a boogie video before right i mean there's pro probably around 50 million it's like okay so now you're just tapping into the general ecosystem of like of people and over time in the comments you started to see more and more people like oh i didn't know who this guy was versus early days it was you know all the really hardcore fans so but outside of that there was really no big marketing i maybe had planned a few other things that just to kind of make sure but the thing about youtube is if it's good youtube will market it for you right if it keeps people watching and it, it ha is in a content pocket or sphere that has a built-in market, YouTube will YouTube will work on your your behalf. That's great, thank you. All right, do we have any last questions? All right, that seems to be it. All right, so I just want to say thank you so much uh, for agreeing to doing this. It was a pleasure speaking with you about the documentary and about your career and such. And yeah, no, a lot of fun, guys, and I'd say. You know, whatever you do, um, you know, film school, much of what, what you will learn will be completely inapplicable and meaningless. Um, some of which you will learn will be applicable. But you are entering an industry that is completely void of any norm. Your resume means nothing. Your uh, education, frankly, means nothing. Only thing that really matters is your portfolio and your ability to show an employer or other people what you can do. So, you know, do the classes. I think everyone has a different learning um, format, but I would encourage everyone in their free time, if you want to be a writer, be writing things and have a, a simple website portfolio with that on there. If you want to be an editor, start editing things and be okay in the early days with doing free work or very, 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 very discounted work, the value of doing something for free in the long run, as long as you're able to present your best work through the process of doing that is much more than a turn down opportunity because you wouldn't be paid. And I, um, even on the boogie, I made no money on the boogie. I mean, because it had limited ads. But to me, I'm even, you know, 30 years old, still taking that I don't do it on everything. I, I, I wouldn't have been able to pay for the boogie. But in the early days of anything, be prepared to, to do things for free, and, and but do it in a way that ends up having your best work. I will also say, this is uh, unsolicited advice, but I'm just going to give advice. I'm going to hang up. So, so But um, most people, in this film world or any type of freelance or video production, editing, whatever, the problem a lot of people have, they never have at any one point one thing that they can show that's their, their absolute best work. And there's always these excuses. Ah, well, I was only this. I only had this. You know, it's like, well, like, what are you capable of? 
you should everybody in this room should always have something that they can show that with with a fairly unreasonable uh, in a fairly reasonable way they can say this is the absolute best work I'm capable of. And if you don't have that to show, that's what you should do in the next two, three, four weeks, and go make it and 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 be able to have that because then no one could ever know what you can do. And so no one could ever hire you. And then you always have to be sort of explaining why you never, that you're better than you are without having that thing that you can show. And then once you go make that, if it's still shit, like many of my early works were, you just kind of repeat it. And then you find people. Uh, I, I would encourage anyone in any, whether you're editing, shooting, producing, whatever, have a group of people that are much better than you that you can um, kind of be a, a little bit masochistic, if that's a word, with those people that they will just completely shit on you, right? That that you, you go to them with your video and all they do is just tear you apart. And then you go back and do it again. And I, I found this Facebook group early on that I would just post, hey guys, here's this uh, thing I did. And then they would just, I was like, you know, and I found these people that I could, that, that could just destroy me. And then I would just remake it and remake it and remake it. So I would encourage all of you continue ed your education, um, but try to carve out five hours a week, 10 hours a week um, so that you're not in a position at the end of this education that you have an interest, whether it's in editing or whatever, that you haven't taken the extra time to spearhead the producing or creation of content um, on, on your side, on the side, when other people have, right? I mean, 30 years ago, you all could have just taken your resume and gotten a job because it's like, well, there's an industry. But now there's all these people that aren't in this class today that are just freelancing right now and, and doing work. And, and their portfolio will mean uh, just as much uh, or, or, or more than a, a degree with a with a small portfolio. The final thing also is um, make sure if you if you have an interest in getting a job in something, maybe you want to get a job doing commercials or whatever, that the work you're making in your free time, your portfolio, is relevant as much as it can be to that job that you're going to attempt to get. A lot of people, when they apply to my production company or whatever, they're sending me these obscure student projects, right? That um, uh, have nothing to do with the work that my business does. So I have to make these mental gymnastics of, oh, well, if this applied to this, I, I would, it, it could be useful. So that's the other thing I would recommend. If you want to work making commercials in some sector, go do that and, and, and be able to present that work uh, that's relevant. Don't make some comedy sketch or some type of thing that is completely irrelevant. This has nothing to do with Boogie 298. It's much less entertaining, but I, I wanted to leave you with some level of productive insight that hopefully you can use to advance your career. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for that. And I'll say let's all give a, a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, have a great rest of your night. And it was, it was great to join you guys. All right. Take care. Okay, bye.